are getting back online for another chill evening here. Hello, hello. All right. So we now have Tuco Cam featuring my kitty here sleeping next to the heater. <laughs> and so tonight, um, there are a couple things we could work on. Um, I'm, I've got a few upcoming videos in progress, so the, uh, the choices are a little nonlinear here tonight. Um, so from the last stream, we've got this uh, little critter here, the face dancer, which I finished assembling on the last stream, but we did a brief test and it didn't seem to work. So uh, some time to, or some chance to debug that. And um, I suspect that'll mostly just be looking at it quickly with the oscilloscope and finding the problem and fixing that. Um, and then if that all works according to plan, then we could actually start using that for something. Uh, and it's, it's a little device, if you haven't heard of it, um, so it's called the Face Dancer. And it's a little device that lets you emulate a USB device by writing Python code that runs on another computer attached to this also via USB. So that's why this has two USB ports. Um, and it's useful for a lot of things. Here's another one that's uh, professionally assembled. And um, in this case, I want to use it to emulate this debug adapter for um, a particular uh, microcontroller, the uh, Sanyo slash on semiconductor LC87. Uh, so they've got some tools you can download, including a debugger, but the debugger needs this specific piece of hardware that I can't get. And so um, this is for a video on uh, doing some reverse engineering on a, a a Wacom uh, drawing tablet that uses this processor. So in order to, uh, to get some use out of those tools without having the hardware adapter, I programmed this microcontroller to, uh, this one in particular, uh, the Great Fet, to pretend to be that microcontroller just barely well enough that I could use it to run the debugger and use its disassembler and kind of make faster progress at reverse engineering the firmware that used uh, that particular tool chain. So, while I could just uh, do a video on that version of it, um, and I've already published that version of the project um, on, uh, in uh, the uh, POC or GTFO, um, and I think also on GitHub. Um, but, you know, it seems like a perfect use for the Face Dancer, and so this would be a great example to kind of port that part of the project over to Face Dancer and just have a little Python script that does that instead of a really ugly patch for the firmware that runs on this thing. Um, and that would be, you know, a pretty good illustration kind of step by step for how to get through uh, the process of um, kind of it, pretending to be whatever a particular piece of hardware or software is expecting, you know, it, this is kind of a common task in reverse engineering where you have part of a system, you don't have the whole system, and in order to make some sense of that, you have an opportunity to kind of fake out the rest of the system in order to make that little part operate kind of like it's in a Petri dish. So in this case, the part that I have that I'm kind of trying to articulate uh, by hand is this debugger that knows how to disassemble code. Um, but in order to make it work, I need to make it think it has a target that it's attached to, uh, something to debug. So the patch that I made for this, uh, whenever the debugger asks for information about the, the target program, um, it just gives it whatever file I gave it. So before I get too deep into this, I should remember to start all the recording things because that's what, uh, that's what the, uh, the second part of this, uh, part of the reason I do this is because, you know, it's, um, it's nice to make the stream, but I also am recording kind of higher quality footage that I edit together into these uh, kind of more control freak, densely packed together videos that I like doing. Um, and so this footage with the face dancer is kind of multi-purpose. There's some of it that'll go toward um, a, another, another video on the Wacom tablet uh, hacking. So. Using, using that to make the tool that lets me uh, get uh, a disassembly of the firmware that I got a, an extracted copy of in the last uh, video on that. Um, 
But then I also want to use some of this footage for another video that I'm making that's uh, kind of a commission on uh, surface mount soldering and board assembly and that kind of thing. And so I, for that, I just want to do a variety of techniques that you can do on both kind of professionally manufactured boards, but also on boards that you might make at home or, you know, boards that might, you know, be delicate in some way. So you need to kind of treat them gingerly instead of just putting the whole thing in the oven. Um, so let me get a quick drink and uh, start the recording widgets and I'll be right back. Over there, I've got Ableton recording the audio, and I, I've got it doing this thing where it mixes everything down into one track that I usually find sufficient, but if there's some problem with that, then I've also got all the other tracks saved off separately so I can, you know, add one or just redo the mix if I need to. Um, man, it's cold. I'm, I'm such a Californian. It's probably like 60 in here. Um, I'll just scoot closer to Tuco. Let me put the Tuco cam back on, actually. I don't need to, uh, to fill up the whole screen with this low-res webcam. So I think that's, that's gonna be the, the good screen here. All right. So, where were we? So, I like these vices, but sometimes they don't quite sit flat. Get them seated just right. All right, so we had this thing. And I think visually we already took a pretty close look at it and it seemed to be fine. And we attached it and the FTDI serial port over on this side was showing up fine. And we just weren't getting any contact from the bootloader on this processor, which could mean a number of things. So, now we have an oscilloscope over here, which is a good thing to try at this point. So actually, let me switch from the microscope back over to the computer. Cool. And I need a couple of USB cables. Wild Mania from Croatia. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm glad we have Tuco Cam. It's, he's such a critter. Oh, that wallpaper is, uh, <laughs> that was something I put together kind of, well, it was a photo I took a while ago, but I kind of fished it out recently uh, for this uh, stream. The, the symbol is this kind of little scan lime icon that I made for myself a while ago. And um, a while ago, I, I was testing out some kind of artsy PCB uh, techniques. Um, and so this was for kind of an art installation where I wanted a bunch of pieces that were simultaneously electrical and aesthetic. So I was experimenting with this technique of, you know, milling circuit boards, but then also covering them with wax and then heating them up to kind of evaporate the wax. And so um, that's kind of a static object. Those bubbles are frozen in, in the cooled wax, and that's just a close-up photograph of it. Oh, um, the Haxnut earrings. Um, those I got on Amazon. I think they're um, I think they're gauge six or something like that. There's a lot of a lot of good jewelry on Amazon. <laughs> I think uh, I was I was pretty surprised to find it on there, but uh, they've been holding up pretty nicely. All right, so we've got a USB cable. There's this tool that I still really like called USB Prober. I know Apple doesn't officially support it anymore, but um, 
Now, actually, I've been meaning to show people how to download this because it's a little bit annoying, but I think it's so worth having. Because let me show you the replacement. The, the new tool that Apple expects you to use is this thing, IO Registry Explorer. Um, and IO Registry Explorer is, is kind of the Mac device tree. Um, and it, you know, if you're familiar with the, uh, the IO Kit uh, programming APIs for devices on Mac OS, these are these IO service objects that represent just sort of any hardware object in the kernel. And you know, all of them have properties, and it's really general because you, know, you can get all this information about PCI devices or USB devices or uh, you know, this, is, this is the high definition audio codec, and, and it all kind of has this nice programming model. Um, and it does give you this view of just the USB objects. Um, so, I don't know. I guess, actually, honestly, I'm looking at this, and I think they've improved this a bit since I used it last. So, maybe I'm just being a curmudgeon by sticking to USB prober. So, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll get with the times, and let's use IO Registry Explorer and, and see if it's not terrible. Because I, I admit, I had kind of given up on this tool when it was new, but it looks like... Um, it might be less of a crashy, never updating, automatically mess. So let's actually see if, um, oh, I was going to plug this in to, just to test it, but it's a, uh, that needs a micro USB. I'm lazy. Let me just plug in a USB stick. Oops. Well, I plugged in the USB stick. And I don't see anything. Although this USB stick might actually kind of flaky. Oh, what is perylene? Oh, conformal coding. I've so I haven't done that for serious in a while. I've I've had jobs in the past where we had to coat circuits like very like one. I, I did this like kind of aerospace thing in college, but um, now I'm not really familiar with the chemicals myself, and I haven't had to do any of that uh, really seriously here. I, I did pick up um, just a bottle of some brush-on conformal coating from Fry's Electronics a while ago that I used for some things, but um, you know, I've, I've never used the really uh, you know, serious stuff where you know, it's expensive and you can dip entire boards. and um, in you know, in the past, in the previous video, I was just using some like spray paint, but that's you know clearly not going to be rated for anything. I'm going to grab a different USB stick because I think this one might just be flaky. I'm just going to take it apart and use it for soldering practice. So. USB stick. Okay, well maybe I have to restart a registry explorer. Or maybe I am gonna go back to USB prober. Let me give this one more shot. I don't see this thing that I just plugged in. But then again, I also don't see it in Finder, so maybe this is also a silly USB stick. It's also possible this hub doesn't like me. There are always so many... Oh, or it might just be this VM is trying to steal everything. If the VM steals it, it'll still show up in USB Prober or IO Registry Explorer, though, so that doesn't actually explain it. Okay, I don't know if that was just like a flaky port on that hub or what, but now it seems to be showing up. Let's see if it actually refreshes automatically. So it looks like when I unplug the device, IO Registry Explorer lets me see the properties on the no longer existing object, which is kind of neat. And if I plug in a new one, oh, that silly thing happens. Okay. Oh, you see what happened there? 
Okay, I know I ran, went on a slight rant about this last time, but that thing where the device connects and then it's in purgatory and then you answer the dialog box and then you could see it there briefly reconnecting um, in iRegistry Explorer. But anyway, it does finally settle into a good state and, and now we can see the device. So, okay, iRegistry Explorer is still on a good side. Let's try plugging in this circuit board we're working on. Why, why is VMware Fusion gross? Or am I just inviting a troll when, when I ask that question? I mean, there's a lot of things that are bad about it, but there's also some things I really like, and I did put a lot of time into it. Oh, you mean the bug is gross? <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things where, um, like, I don't know, I, I, I wish that so much of the effort that had been put into the virtualization engine at VMware had gone into open source software and we could have had more of a diversity of user interfaces for it, because that was totally like a user interface decision that caused the bug rather than something that was intrinsically necessary. All right, so here I'm just plugging this thing into, okay, I'm going to close this VM until we need it because I don't actually need this VM quite yet. I, I had this VM open because I was installing that Sanyo software that I'm trying to fake out in it just in case we get to that point later. Um, so I didn't want to be waiting for Windows activation because that's what ended up happening. <laughs> Stuff that I, I'd rather do before the stream. Okay, so now we've got, just for testing, this is, the, this is the one that is known good, and it's showing up with that uh, FT232, like we'd expect. And now if we plug in the one that we just made, I think it'll also show up with an FT232. And there we go. Cool. So now, let's just see if this serial adapter itself is working, and then try to trace where the problems are showing up in communicating with the bootloader. So this I think will be easier with the um, schematic up. Actually, it'd be nice to install EagleCat on this machine since I think that's what the face dancer is in, but I think there's also a PDF. These are what I want. The streaming setup is kind of crazy and I've got the resolution not nearly as high as I'd like it right now, so sorry if the screen's a little blurry. But I've got it recording um, straight off of the HDMI output, but for the stream's sake, it's actually like mirroring over AirPlay to an AirPlay server that OBS is then screen capping on a different machine. So anyway, that does not seem to have the Eagle files. Well, maybe I'll just install Eagle really quick on this machine, and if it's slow, I'll just throw the bolt for Tuco. I didn't already install this, did I? No, <laughs> that would be that would be too silly, too thinking ahead for me. Oh. Been there, done that.
Oh, I don't understand the question. What does Explorer show when you redirect to Fusion? Uh, kernel shim. I don't know if you're talking about the UBS or the sorry the USB or the video. For the USB uh, grabbing that VMware does, it does use a kernel module for that. There's this. Um, actually, that was was one of the first things like at VMware where I felt like, oh, I wrote this. This component is like my thing. It's uh, called vmioplug.kext. And it's this thing that um, you can kind of program to unplug and replug other USB devices on your behalf. And so that's the thing that's ultimately responsible for all the mayhem when the mayhem ensues. Oh, the face dancer is uh, this uh, device that a security researcher named Travis Goodspeed designed. And it's intended to be a, kind of a programmable USB device for finding either you know, vulnerabilities in USB device drivers or just kind of doing weird things with USB. Good old software signing, protecting us from everything. Oh, where is that? I forget where that setting was. I feel like I was just looking at it. Oh, it's here. Yes. Great. Okay, now we can actually open the schematic and see where we want to probe. So the other bit of setup we've got here is actually an oscilloscope that runs on the computer, which is normally not something I'm a huge fan of because they tend to be kind of slow and um, kind of un just generally underperform standalone oscilloscopes in every possible way. But um, the nice thing about them is that you can actually screen capture them pretty easily. So I happen to have this old one called a bitscope. Whoa, did that just happen? Thanks, VM. Wow, I'm glad that I don't have to debug those anymore. So many things that can go wrong. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 multiple words. I like those, you know. I, I like passwords where you can, um, you know, you can remember them, but they still have a lot of entropy, which usually means they're long and don't necessarily have a lot of weird numbers and symbols. Um, but I also like password managers, so it's kind of a fluke that I can even remember that one. Uh, that's right. So that's my scope. You can tell that it's slow because it connects over a USB serial adapter but it'll be totally fast enough for what we're doing here. I think this one goes up to 40 mega samples, um, two channel, eight bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to have, so I haven't actually gone shopping for, um, you know, for like, non-giant scopes in a while because, you know, now the, I mean, nowadays scopes are, are, aren't as big. When I got this bit scope, I had previously used like a CRT analog scope and it was still kind of hard to find uh, like, you know, decent digital scopes that weren't laggy and stuff. So, um, yeah, no, I would love to find something that actually has some decent bandwidth, either just like a direct HDMI out or something like USB 2 or USB 3. I mean, even just high-speed USB 2, so 480 megabits, would be enough bandwidth to refresh the screen um, at quite nice rates. So, you know, it's, it's not like interconnect is necessarily the problem anymore. I think it might, 
you know, so either either they exist and I just haven't seen them because I haven't done the research, or they, uh, you know, they don't necessarily exist for a good price because they just aren't in demand because standalone scopes are good enough now. But yeah, no, I would love a scope that is easier to demo and. I've thought about uh, modifying some of the instruments I have to have, uh, you know, some kind of streamable output, especially the, uh, this little thermal camera, it's, I don't have it right here, but it's, um, you know, FLIR markets it as like, not a thermal camera really, but like a fancy thermometer that makes pictures because the, the, it uses the really low res, like 80 by 60 FLIR lepton sensor and the, the pixels themselves aren't calibrated thermally, just the overall temperature sensor that it also has. So it isn't super useful as like a precision instrument, but it was their most inexpensive thing that had a thermal camera and it's totally good enough for finding like hotspots on electronic circuits you're diagnosing. Um, so I have one of those and I've thought about uh, modifying its firmware to have a, you know, like a streaming output over Wi-Fi because there'd be plenty of bandwidth for that and I, I've checked it's got like an STM32 processor with USB. Um, I think you can do firmware updates over micro SD so that might be a fun project. Um, that might be a fun one to do uh, on video if anybody's interested. Let's get some serial data going so we can actually see if this is working. Let's see if I have Minicom. Nope, wrong operating system. I think one of these Linux VMs I have probably has Minicom, but this is easy enough. I'm really thankful for Homebrew. It's nice to actually have a package manager. Um, does this need root? I think, yeah, dash capital D. And assume that's the one, because the one that my scope is on got disconnected. Okay, so if I type here, I don't see LEDs blinking right away. Oh, actually, I take that back. Yes, I do, they're just really faint. Let's see if I can get that under the microscope or maybe the DSLR. Turn this light off. So now if I type, oh, that's not showing up on the camera, they're so faint. All right, microscope. have to turn off the overhead lights for this. Oh, yeah, you can see that, but it'll be better if I turn off the overhead. <laughs> and this one. Man, I like how bright these LED panels are. Okay, that's, that's over, overdoing it. with the color temperature on these lights too much. I had them just like I like them. I think that's all right. Uh, I don't like how harsh that is. I hope, hope everybody's enjoying me whining about my own lighting. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I have just a little bit of this on. not too bad. I mean, I don't even know if I'll use this footage, but if I do, I want it to actually look good. So, I mean, this isn't even going to be like a plot line in a video. This is like montage kind of material. I'm, I'm probably going to put this together into something that is relatively fast and part of another storyline. So, it's not like a lot of this is going to end up in big chunks. It'll be more like something I draw bits and pieces from. But anyway, I'm pretty happy with that bit. I'm gonna turn these lights back on and sit down. <laughs> oh, 
All right. Anyway, so the lights work. Let's see what the outputs look like. So. For that, let's grab that schematic too. Oops. Laptop with the chat just went to sleep. Okay, cool, let's go back to the slightly wider view. No, not that. Yeah, that's fine. I guess I didn't make a preset for OBS that has the DSLR big and the other cameras. That's fine. Well, we want to go back to the computer anyway. All right. So. All right, so this Goodfet is kind of the umbrella project that has all of the different bits and pieces for the remote control microcontrollers, of which Face Dancer is one. So Face Dancer 21 is the version we're putting together, and these are the EagleCAD files. Great. Now our roadmap for debugging. And we could have gotten pretty much all of this information just by looking at the data sheets for these chips, but it's nice to use this when it's available. Okay. So let's start out just by taking a look at the serial data on, say, pin 5 over here. Um, and over here on pin 33. Oh, I guess we want pin pin one over here for transmit and pin 33 for receive if we're looking at data coming out of Minicom. So let's just poke right at that pin since that seems like an easy thing to check and that'll just tell, if, tell us if serial data is getting to the microcontroller. out of the shadow of the microscope. is necessarily grounded since it's milled away separately from the actual ground in the circuit. So I'm just going to clip onto the other USB connector, which I guess I will test to see if this is properly grounded by touching the five volts. <laughs> I think the camera can see this quite a lot better than I can right now. Tempting just to solder on a temporary ground for this. So 
that. Oh, I think I have this probe on times 10, and the scope doesn't know about it, about that, so let's have a little more gain. Oh, what is that? Okay, maybe that is not a good ground. <laughs> maybe that's what that means. Uh, uh, the whole back side is ground, so I can rely on that. So if I just clip this alligator on the side, then I should get a decent ground. Let's check that. There we go. So ground is ground, and that is 5 volts. So now we've tested our test instrument. We can actually look at the serial data and see if it looks serially enough. So we're looking for this pin 33 on the microcontroller. And that orientation happens to match the way the board is facing right now, which is convenient. a little closer for this actually. This angle is not the greatest. arm is a bit wobbly when I move it, and it has to kind of settle down a bit. Okay. So there's our serial data, which is hovering at 1.5 volts, which is not great. It might mean that I'm not actually getting the right signal. Or that might be our problem. So that could just be that the serial is shorted to ground or to something else, or not to ground necessarily, but to something else that's pulling toward ground with a similar impedance. So I tried to get into Minicom while I'm holding this probe. All right, let's try to trigger on that. Yeah, that's definitely shorted to something. So there might be a short between two nearby pins on the processor or the FTDI. Let's switch to the microscope. So, oh man, let's get another, another different ground for this that is maybe slightly more ergonomic. Oh, that should do. Also, tea is awesome. Everyone should drink tea if they like it. Oh man, Tuco, Tuco is doing some quality napping. Let's see if we can change position here.
<laughs> Aww. <laughs> Tuco, you get into the most difficult to film positions sometimes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Aww. Hmm. All right. So, yes, that's that's much easier to see with the microscope. Cool. <laughs> so maybe zoom this out slightly. Well, that's fine. I don't think I'm going to use that piece. So that signal is our problematic one. Let's see where it goes. So that was pin 33 on the microcontroller or pin 1 over here on the FTDI chip. So is that one right there. So that part looks fine. Let's check the other side of the board. some bits of stuff, but I don't think there's actually a connection there, and this isn't really acting like a short to ground, it's acting like a short to another I.O. signal. I mean, that could be an issue, but... This is, of course, the hardest to debug a place if the problem is actually under the chip, and that might require taking the chip off. So, I'm going to clean the areas around where the signal is just to make sure that isn't the problem, that there isn't any, like, loose debris or conductive gunk. Um, but if that doesn't fix it, then I think the next step in debugging this is to isolate this signal somewhere where it's easy to kind of cut it in half so we can see on which side of that cut the problem is. So that'll tell us if... Uh, I see something kind of weird between those pins. Might just be my imagination or a reflection, though. But... Yeah, it, I, at this point, I want to I want to know whether I've got to take this chip off. So, knowing whether the short is under this chip or somewhere else is the next question to answer. But first of all, some cleaning, because cleaning is easy, and it might fix it, in particular around there and around there are the areas that this problem might be in. So, yeah, hidden DIY vias, good stuff. And I like to use just isopropanol. It's a good kind of all-purpose electronics cleaner because it won't kind of corrode electronic-y things like water does. But it dissolves most of this crud. There are other solvents that will dissolve more of it, but usually I don't have to go that far. Now this DIY copper board just... Unless you find some way of coating it pretty soon after making the board, then it just ends up looking kind of all nasty because of the various soldering crimes and corrosion. Uh, 
Oh, there's some little bits of those bits of the uh, pads are kind of coming up a little bit. And that isn't, oh man, these tweezers are giant. Let's find some smaller tweezers. Ooh, I think these are my smallest currently. So, yeah. Just want to like, keep these from waggling around and shorting. So I'd rather pull them off than having them stick there if they're loose. Okay, this is a little off topic, but these are bothering me, so I might as well prevent them from getting any worse. Conductive debris is, is just the worst. Like there, there are a lot of things that will just cause you a headache that is temporary and reversible. Conductive debris is not one of those. It will often cause you really annoying problems that just totally ruin your day. Oh, thank you. I think this isn't probably the view I'm going to be using for this part anyway, but it's nice to have this, so maybe I can reposition this and get a slightly nicer angle if I need a wider shot. I really like this arm. This is the, I think it's the Manfrotto magic arm. It's like looking for something that would just let me move the camera anywhere. I just use like clamps and light stands for everything here. Yeah, these little tiny bits of copper, this is another limitation in terms of the, the kind of smallness you can get on the kind of at home boards. It's just if you're dealing with board substrate that doesn't have great quality adhesion, then these traces that are small, besides being hard to cut, are just going to also be prone to breaking apart. Ah, this cleans off the oxidation pretty easily. I wouldn't expect this gook to be conductive, but, you know, being on the safe side here. It's, I mean, I wouldn't think that anything that happens like metallurgically to the copper would be conductive, but maybe there's like other debris on here that would have some conductivity to it. Buy another one of those little, a couple of these little doodads. <laughs> That's so annoying. I'm just gonna take those off. <laughs> I'll pro I might regret doing this later, but at this point, it seems to make sense. enough. Uh, the camera is a, is a Canon. It's not a, it's not a video camera. It's a DSLR. I didn't get it specifically for making videos, although that's pretty much entirely what I use it for now. Um, yeah, at some point it might be worth getting an actual video camera for this, but like right now the only 
The only complaints I have about it are that it does the thing where it stops after 30 minutes. Um, as far as the quality and lenses and stuff, like I really like the lens and like if I got a video camera, it'd be really nice if it was something that was compatible with the Canon lenses that I have. Okay. Now, let's see if I can just use the multimeter to get some clues about how this might be shorted. I've not done an investigation of what the of the differences are in different quality boards. I think right now I have some pretty nice. Um, so I think I think this is actually some of the stuff that the the other mill folks sell in their online shop because um, I, I have one of their mill machines and so I got some of their stuff to try out with it. Um, but I've also done a lot of milling on some really cheap grody stuff that I got. Um, and most of the cheap stuff that I found like on eBay is just single-sided. So um, I guess as a re result, I've ended up doing most of my single-sided work on the really cheap stuff. And these double-sided boards have all been on the kind of nicer stuff that uh, other mill sells. But, you know, it, it's not going to be, I think, like I've never seen this like kind of epoxy-based uh, board be as anywhere as strong as the fiberglass boards that you usually see. So, like, it just doesn't seem like these are usually made with strength in mind. Oh, hey, Tuco. Good cat. The wooden cotton swabs are really nice. I like these a lot. They last a long time. I think I got these... I probably got this particular pack on Amazon. I think I first found those, like, on the aisles of Fry's Electronics or something, but... Oh, every so often, OBS lags behind a little bit. I tried to get this to hit 30 frames a second on all the different scenes, but it gets a little behind sometimes. Anyway. So it's got a half a mega ohm to ground, which seems about reasonable for like an IO thing. Um, just for testing, I'm gonna make sure this has a good connection to the pin on the FTDI that it's supposed to go to. Point 0.3 ohms, nice. And also point 0.3 ohms. Okay, so and that's the same half a mega ohm, half a mega ohm, and yeah, these are all half a meg, and uh, that's also just going to be ground. So nothing nearby on there seems shorted, on uh, here. Three quarters of a meg. Actually, let me put the DSLR somewhere where it can see the meter. Oh, the anti-static brushes are great too. I've got one of those like on this desk somewhere, right here. Yeah. Yeah, I should probably use that, that on this board momentarily. Oh, clearly I need like an articulated stand to put this at just the right angle to avoid glare. Maybe I stand it up on the back and then uh, move the camera. Oh, that's not bad. In fact, it's pretty visible.
And I like filming so much stuff under this microscope, even if I wouldn't normally have to do it under the microscope, just because it makes stuff that would be totally invisible actually kind of really interesting to watch. Okay, I'm gonna just try pulling up the circuit board layout because it would be useful to know which things this might have been likely to short to. We can see about confirming one of those. Uh, oh man, I'm not used to this version of Eagle. Because, like, I just downloaded the latest trial version for the purposes of this recording, but I have, like, a license for the previous major version, so... Um, anyway, there's usually just a button to switch to the board. Maybe I'll just open it separately. Oh, or it's right here. I'll just double-click that. Great. Solved. Okay. So, that's the thing. No. That doesn't look right. I don't know why this is connected to that, or if it is, in fact, that looks really weird. Maybe I'm missing something from the schematic. Let's see, which pin is that? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I missed that this was connected to there also. That's good. What is that? I should be zooming with this thing. CA out? Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. That's the serial RX pin, but this is another pin that's also connected to RX. So I don't know why they did that, but presumably there's a good reason. I don't have to worry about it as long as the circuit is functioning. So this, like unless it shorted to something nearby here or it's like the only thing around here is ground fill. Oh, let's probe around with the meter a bit. So, that's sixth from the left side. one, but not its neighbors, so that's good so far. And then that goes through a via that's under this chip, and connects to this via. Well, I think, I mean, I can pull out this via, because this via is easy to remove, but I can't imagine that the problem would be, like, between here and here. I mean, that would still, like, I'm still gonna do that before pulling this chip off, because, you know, that just makes sense, and that rules out the problem being in, like, somewhere under here, which it still could be. Um, man. Unless the problem is conductive debris. <laughs> See a little bit there. Well, take 
another look at that on the oscilloscope and try to get a sense of like what kind of failure this actually is, like what it might be shorted to. Like it looked like it was shorted to something else, uh, like another I.O. line that was trying to drive toward ground. I'll wake up the chat computer again. I wouldn't have this computer set to go to sleep if I was actually smart. Hmm. Man, Tuco's having such a nap. <laughs> He's gonna wake up at some point and just want to play Bolt. Like he will, he will want to play fetch, and there's there's nothing else in his universe except for fetching little plastic bolts at that point. All right. So let's switch to the oscope. It would help if I actually plug this into USB. I'm also just gonna like dump some garbage into the serial port so we have a test signal to watch. I don't wanna just be banging on Minicom. All right, it's plugged in. Oh, Minicom, did it automatically reopen that? Can't tell, the LEDs, I don't see anything on the LEDs, but the LEDs as we have established are super dim. just going to use this to set up the serial port and just do that. And hmm. doesn't look right. I'm skeptical that this is actually transmitting to the serial port the way I want. Um, let's test this again with just typing in Minicom since we've established that that setup works already. Oh, yeah, I think I just had the scope zoomed way too far out. Eh, that's better. It definitely seems shorted to a signal, but 1.4 volts, hmm. Oh, I'm getting something occasionally where it's going all the way down to zero. At least I thought I saw something like that. Oops. Yeah. Maybe I can just use Minicom to send a file. file should I send? Any pictures to send? I don't think I have any pictures. How about documents? Any Dropbox? Go to? Oh man, this file browser. 
is super weird. Okay, I don't know how to change directories other than by typing in the path. Okay, let's just send this PDF. Oh my, how, I clearly don't know how to use this software. I remember using this ages ago, so I clearly knew how to at one point. <laughs> that may or may not have actually done anything. Okay, I might just write like a loop in PySerial or something. Or I might just pull out this via So that little spike at the beginning of the packet is interesting. Like, it's probably nothing. Like, it probably just means that the I/O driver delivers extra current when the I/O first changes state. But like, maybe that indicates that it's shorted to something USB related on the FTDI chip side. So. Oh well, pulling out that via will tell us what side the failure is on, and it'll be pretty easy to do, so let's just do that. Oh, soldering iron's cold, but it warms up fast. Just clean this, but I want some flux so that it melts smoothly, and I can just pull the little bit of wire in there out of the hole. These are some DIY vias that I put in. Um, actually, prior to the previous stream, um, I filmed this but didn't stream it, um, and I made these by just putting wire in, soldering it on both sides, and then sanding them as flat as I could practically. <laughs> Oh, so there's a question from chat. Uh, how good is Bitscope? Um, I have mixed feelings about Bitscope. There, there are some things that I like about it, but overall I've been kind of disappointed with it and I wouldn't really recommend it. Um, I mean, I, I still use it occasionally, but, um, you know, and especially now that it's useful for the streaming, but it's definitely kind of, at least the one that I have, which is one of their low-end models, is, isn't really the kind of performance I would expect from a digital oscilloscope under a lot of circumstances. Um, I mean, it, this one is 40 mega samples, which, you know, if you're used to digital scopes, kind of tells you what to expect. Um, but then there's this additional layer of, oh, well, does the UI work? And is it gonna work with my drivers? And does the, you know, and then that whole rigmarole. And in fact, I'm running it in a VM right now because their latest Bitscope software doesn't work on current versions of Mac OS. So to fix the compatibility, I'm just running their Linux software in a VM. Um, they've got other scopes that attach over Ethernet. Um, this one attaches over USB and it's just got an FTDI chip in it. So internally it's a serial port scope, which doesn't have a whole lot of bandwidth for refreshing fast. So yeah, overall, I mean, could be better, but I have found it useful for a bunch of things. and. You know, I, I had certainly gone for years with it being the only scope in my shop, and, you know, it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't as good as it could have been. All right, this should be plenty warm. Let's uh, pull out this via. Oh, let me restart this camera, too, because it's about to quit. Maybe I'll just end up pushing it through instead of grabbing it from the top. That, that might be much easier. Uh, I need a little tiny piece of wire like the ones that always get stuck in my feet. 
I'll just use something of the same gauge that the vias are made out of, which is this 26 gauge solid wire. <laughs> so I definitely could cut and patch instead of removing the chip. Um, it kind of depends on what your goals are. Like if you're trying to test the design versus if you're trying to demo a technique versus if you're trying to just get the job done. Um, and so well, like with this particular board, if I was just trying to get the job done, I, you know, there's no reason to use a DIY circuit board because it's a design that is pretty readily available. But I thought it made a pretty good demo for various reasons. And um, I, I've definitely faced that dilemma though with other projects. Um, okay, I think on this side it is no longer actually connected, so I want to start grabbing it from the other side. There was this thing I, I was working on recently, um, which I, I hope to put into video pretty soon, but I can't just yet because it's in one of those situations where we want to make sure that, you know, we're not putting out information about vulnerabilities before they're fixed. Um, and so um, in, in that project, I had a, uh, I was just trying to make sure I remember which of these vias it is, because there are so many of these that are all very similar, but it's this one here. Yeah, on this other project, I, I needed to separate all of the VCC pins on the, on a microcontroller from the circuit board um, to try voltage glitching. And there was definitely a point where I wasn't sure whether it was faster to do that mod or to just design a completely new circuit board and move over any of the parts that I needed to from the original board. And, you know, a lot of that might just depend on what tools you find easiest to work with or what you're most familiar with because, you know, for different people, I could see either of those being faster. Smoothing out some of this, but it's mostly a lost cause. All right, let's see what that waveform looks like now, if this actually fixed anything. Or, you know, not fixed, but helped illuminate where the problem is. end up taping these wires down just so they don't move on their own like that. Although in this case I might just put the meter on top of it. There's something actually very satisfying to me about a setup where you have all these wires like taped down to the desk. You know, it's some kind of compromise between, you know, impermanence and kind of organizing the chaos. So we've got that. Oh, right, Minicom. Okay. That's actually probably pretty good news. So this means the problem is probably not under the microcontroller. It's probably either a problem with the FTDI itself somehow, like I just burned it out, or it's a short under the FTDI because I'm seeing the exact same behavior right here on the top side of the VIA, which is kind of fragile. I've got to be careful not to damage the VIA with my scope probe. So let me carefully probe this, maybe not by the via, maybe by this pin. Um, 
this left edge of the via has some very thin copper and after pulling out the wire it's a little bit delicate at this point. So I'm just going to try giving it some serial data just to make sure we're seeing the same behavior and yep that looks pretty much the same. That actually might just be, like I wonder if it's the serial and um, you know, some other, like, I, I want to say USB, but if that was shorted to the USB, we would be seeing start of frame packets every millisecond. And likely the USB just wouldn't work. So, I think the next step is to look at the PCB layout again, just to see where that might be shorted, and then probably end up having to take off this chip, but at least this chip is not, I mean, I'll have to use the air tool, so it's, it's one of those things where the demo kind of has to include that in its requirements now, like, oh, if you get into this situation, it's kind of hard to recover without an air tool, but it's still good to demo that. I mean, there are other ways to get these off. Um, like, kind of my favorite non-air tool method is to use this stuff called chip quick, which is just low temperature solder. Um, but even that, I, I would expect it to damage a homemade board like this because these are just not super heat resistant, uh, nor super mechanically strong. <laughs> All right, let's get the board layout back. Well, so that shouldn't be connected to anything else. Hmm. I wonder if it's worth just checking out the 3.3 volt supply on this chip just to see. I mean, I think the FTDI has the linear regulator that everything else is using. So, you know, and I think I already checked that 3.3, but let's just check that again to make sure. Um, is that this pin? Yeah. Fourth from the left up there, or this capacitor. So, yeah. Oh, that looks good. Three point, three point five three volts. So whatever, that's fine. Well, this is looking a lot like either this is just a bad FTDI chip or I somehow have a short like right under this area of this pin. So I think maybe the first thing to try is just to add some flux to this area and then, oh man, is that a piece of conductive debris? I just noticed this between these two pins. What are those pins? Oh man, I should just have the FTDI data sheet handy. It looks like a short from, oh whatever, I'm just gonna remove it. It's a stubborn one. Oh, yeah, that is actually a fairly persistent connection that was just like, like I guess uh, in some places the tool path for milling the board doesn't necessarily uh, like maybe it could overlap a little bit and it doesn't, so it just ends up with these little areas where it kind of pushes the copper into a corner and leaves it there instead of actually taking it out. Uh, yeah, so that, that little bridge right there. Oh, the reason I checked the power supply is just, just to make sure there isn't another thing that accounts for the weird voltage level, so because the, the output was kind of, 
you know, it was if, as if the logic one was like one and a half volts and the logic zero was like one volt is kind of the behavior I was, I was saying, or I was seeing. Um, and that's probably like a short somewhere either around these pins or kind of nearby. Um, but it could also, like some of that could be explained at least by um, kind of having a lower power supply uh, voltage in the chip, and so that could explain why the logic one is not what you would expect. You can also get weird situations like that if, you know, like your grounds aren't connected or, you know, you're just not like measuring a voltage the way that you think you're measuring it. Just pushing on some of these to make sure that they're not like loose, just because it's kind of hard to see the actual solder under. Oh, oh, that one, well, that's what I was checking for. So what is that pin? Oh, that is TXD, which, <laughs> that, uh, is that the one that we're working on right now? Maybe we just didn't actually have a, or no, we were working on RXD. Okay, but that's still, not a good sign. <laughs> that needs fixing. So this is definitely one of those things that you have to watch out for when you do the DIY vias. Um, as I think I mentioned before that the, uh, like a lot of these, um, the connection kind of relies on having kind of a, a vertical solder bridge between the board and the pins because there is a bit of an offset due to the height of the DIY vias. So, Looks like I didn't quite get this uh, covered 100% like I thought. Of course, I'm gonna have to redo this if I pull the chip off, but that's fine. seem to have enough solder. Ah, flux is so great. I mean, not like for your health or anything, but the way it makes solder move is pretty awesome. There's a little bit of metal in there too. I'm gonna see if I can dig it out with the knife. Tasty. Some good, good gooey, fluxy textures in there. All right, let's give this the poke test again. This side you can tell I haven't cleaned as recently. Well, those are all fine. Okay, well, I don't know if that would have fixed it, but if VCC on the uh, FTDI chip wasn't securely connected, that certainly could cause some strange problems. So, uh, yeah, I'll give that a quick clean just so my probes aren't sticky when I'm probing it. Alright. Yeah, this could definitely be an overheated chip. Um, 
or, or static discharge. There, there are a lot of ways that you can damage chips and it's not super apparent. Um, so, it's, I, I think that uh, electronics is definitely one of those things that teaches you uh, good debugging perseverance because there are so many things where you just have to rule out all the possibilities one by one because you don't have a lot of clues as to which one it actually is. Let's get back to the O scope. Oh, zoom out. That looks much better, 3.53 volts, and I suspect if we actually send some serial data that it'll look good. You know, it, so there, there's a comment in, in chat that I would have had real boards if I'd ordered from Oshpark last week, which is true for circuit boards. Like there's a whole argument you can get into about whether it makes the most sense to order a circuit board or make it. And that depends a lot on your project and usually the answer is order the board, but there are some reasons why you might wanna make it. But whether you order the board or you make it yourself, you still have to put the parts on it and that can still go wrong in all sorts of ways. And you know, unless you get it assembled from by someone else, but that's, you know, like if, if you're asking someone else to assemble a board that you've never assembled successfully, then I, I don't know, I think that's asking for trouble. You know, you can have all sorts of back and forth with your manufacturer about resolving problems when you could have just given them a board that you've gotten working and proved the design with and, you know, ask them to make more of those. And that's, I think, a much better situation to be in than trying to wrestle with your manufacturer to figure out who gets to do the work and making the first thing uh, actually come to life. So, I... Uh, let's see, I got slightly distracted. I was going to bring up Minicom and then I got distracted by that solder looking kind of suboptimal. All right, is this still running? It looks dubious. All right, I think that is a scope. All right, that's still looking. Oop, that's still looking good. If I can hold that. Ah, oh, that's so much better. Yeah, this is probably what happens when your FTDI chip has a really lousy connection to VCC. So now we've learned something. Yet another weird failure mode to catalog in the library of weird failure modes to use for fun and profit later. Now to put the via back in and see if we can get further in initializing this board with some firmware. Because I don't see a lot else wrong with it. It looks pretty good. And it'll be nice if we don't have to actually desolder any chips. I, I, I went through the process of making sure that the underneath of the chip was good before putting it down pretty carefully. So I am hoping that work pays off. Oh, let's go back to the microscope. And so, I mean, this particular board is for sure something that I, you know, like I, I have copies of this that are already built that work. And so, you know, it's clear that I don't need to be doing this just to get a working uh, face dancer board. But I, I like, you know, I, I want to illustrate the process. And while you could illustrate the process with something kind of brand new, it's kind of nice to be able to isolate just the thing that you want to practice sometimes. And so 
part of why I chose this design is it's like a real world design. Like most of the face dancer boards that are out there were not made, you know, with a home mill or home etching setup. They were made by a professional board manufacturer and a lot of them were assembled that way too. But, you know, if, if it's something that has that overlap where you can build it yourself and you can get it professionally made, then it lets you practice a skill of making something where you know, in the future you might not have that option and you can actually compare the two side by side, which I find pretty interesting. I think this needs more flux because a lot more of this is sticking to, oh geez, that via is super delicate. It's just coming delaminated off the board right now, so I've got to be really careful with it. And it needs flux. I'm a little skittish about even using the flux pen on this because it's so delicate, so I might use the syringe. It's probably going to put way more flux on here than I need, but it'll be easier to come off, easier to get off later. Oops. Great. Ah, the good stuff. Get another uh, glamour shot of the flux paste here. Where is my remote? I always lose this thing. Here we go. Serious eye damage. Don't squirt it at your eye, kids. Bad for eyes. Good for metal, bad for humans. Ooh, the, uh, that little piece of copper. I just need to be really gentle with it and keep the soldering iron from poking it too hard. That seems good. Uh, except for the bridge on the top, of course, but. There we go. I can barely tell that that's sticking out so far. Let me try to turn it sideways to give more of a 3D view. <laughs> so that's what we've got on this side. A bunch of other previously done vias that are already sanded down. And then on this side, we've got that one that's super delicate and a bunch of other older ones. LEDs. I just get distracted by how shiny everything is under the microscope. Like, I really like the textures. And I always find bits and pieces of this footage that I enjoy editing into stuff for no apparent reason other than because it's pretty. Finish this via. Oh yeah, I've um, actually I'm happy to have two 3D printers. I've got uh, my kind of main printer is a Type A Series One, and then I also have a cute Orion Delta, which is kind of my secondary printer for turning out lots of parts that aren't super big or detailed. And then my first 3D printer was a. Uh, uh, MakerBot, not the cupcake, but the one right after that, the thingamatic. And it was a good lesson in how to upgrade and repair printers. Because that was before, that was before it was considered uncouth to ship a printer with like a DC motor extruder. So, um, 
that was one of the things I replaced after having some pretty bad early problems with it. And ended up totally changing out the hot end and giving it a stepper extruder. And of course, taking out the automatic build platform that was its kind of conveyor belt thing that was, you know, it was kind of a good idea, but uh, yeah, I'm missing my diagonal cutters. It was kind of a good idea, but the parts never really adhered well enough to the platform, which also had to move. It was kind of a mechanically dubious contraption. But I still have that printer, and I've been trying to restore it so that I can give it to a friend, um, giving it like an LCD and an SD card interface so that it's a little more useful. So these diagonal cutters seem to be pretty gentle on, you know, like if you use them carefully and you only cut one thing at a time, but they can just make a huge mess of your circuit if you ever get lazy and try to cut two wires at the same time, because it'll actually just use both of the wires as little levers to rip each other off the board. Oh, hey, Tuco. <laughs> Gotta keep the Tuco cam framed. All right, there's the other one. This is the one that's super delicate, but hopefully pretty well connected. Let's ditch that other wire. Ooh, yeah, you can see that wobble. Ah, <sighs> okay. I think that's fine. It's like a little hovering via. I think I'm gonna hit it with the soldering iron just a bit to see if I can relieve the stress in that solder pad, but I think it's fine. Once this board works, I will probably see if I can coat it. I don't have any like real conformal coating here. Well, actually I might. I should check my chemical box. I might have some conformal coating. But failing that, I also have some cheap options that I can demo, like uh, clear nail polish and spray paint. All right, I think that is fine. You can see this area kind of maintains solder flow like it isn't broken, which is good. All right, I think let's, time, let's try testing this again. <laughs> blink, blink, blink. Okay, we can just talk or type into the serial port and that's flashing, it's good. The lights are less dim now that VCC is no longer having problems. <laughs> oh, so there's a good question in chat. Uh, so the question is, do you go through and clean up extra solder when you're finished? Um, and so that's, uh, that's sort of yes and no. Um, so the, the excess solder is actually not really, uh, like, like these little flat areas right here, you can't really get all the solder off of this copper. Um, like once, once it's kind of coated the copper, you can only really kind of flatten it out. You can't remove it completely. So there's not a whole lot to be done with that on a prototype board unless you just want to add solder everywhere. Um, but the, the excess chemicals, like the flux, you can definitely remove those. And you don't have to, um, as long as it's no clean flux, which means that it's electrically and chemically inert. 
it's still going to be sticky and gross, but it won't like ruin your circuit if you leave it on there. So at that point, it's kind of up to you. You can clean it off and it makes the board less sticky and nicer, but it's not really necessary. So you can find a lot of uh, uh, variation in the cleanliness of commercial products if you take them apart. And you know, and a lot of times you can see that there might be have might have been like multiple solder processes, like uh, you know, like maybe there was a machine soldering process uh, that didn't generate much mess because it was all done using stenciled solder paste that doesn't leave a lot of extra flux after you're done, or maybe it had a washing step. But then maybe there was a selective solder or like a hand soldering process that left some gunk on in parts of the board. Um, so I find, I find that interesting. Like if you take stuff apart, it's nice to guess how it might have been made and, and even to talk to people who do that kind of work. All right, this microscope is interesting, but we should really switch back to the computer and try running the software for this. Oh, nice. Uh, somebody in the chat, Luke, has a, a Type A Series 1 Pro printer, and that's, that's the newer model than the one that I have. I've got the original Type A Series 1. So I, I, I lust after the heated bed a little bit because that's one of the problems with mine. But I, I changed my bed from just a plain glass plate with glue stick to, um, I forget the full name of the surface, but I think the acronym is PEI. It's this like orange plastic that sticks really well to PLA when it's clean. So as long as it's been cleaned really well with isopropyl alcohol, then it actually works as a really low maintenance build plate. Um, so that works pretty well. It still doesn't stick as well as I'd like it to sometimes, but I've got like a, a cheap like foot warmer mat under it that I use as kind of a substitute for an actual heated bed because the heated bed upgrade is kind of expensive. All right. Um, so I think we had, let's see, that's right. It's not on this computer, but we should grab the source for good fit because I think we just need the Python serial library, just like I put in that VM before. Oh, polyetheramide, that might be it. <laughs> Are those cat hairs under the microscope? Probably. Um, yeah, those are probably cat hairs. I'm sorry, Tuco's hair. Some of those are burned and covered in flux. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, just gently, gently wash away the, the cat hair with isopropanol. a little bit of sticky flux over by these LEDs. <laughs> this uh, this Q-tip has about had it. These last a lot longer than the, the regular ones, but they still have some limits. All right. Uh, let's make sure we have all that Python stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think I can install that with Homebrew. Just guessing what the name is. <laughs> Adafruit. Uh, I guess that's just installing it like a regular, maybe I can just use easy install. 
but just that. Okay, maybe that did it. Yay, I have buy cereal. Okay. So client BSL. Okay, now I just need to tell this what's going on. Um I think it was there's there are two arguments it takes, board and good fit, and I always forget which one is in all caps and which one is not in all caps, but let's try this first. If this doesn't work, I'll actually refer to the tutorial. Uh, dump info is what I wanted. I guess that answers my question. Oh, I think that is working. Great. So it's talking to the bootloader and getting some info. So if I remember right, the docs say to save this info just in case. So I'm going to do that. But yeah, now I think we can just tell this to install firmware from the internet, which is pretty magic. Let's make sure we've got this camera on the thing, because I want to show the LEDs too. Well, actually the microscope's got the best view. Seems fine, as long as that doesn't turn into hair cam. There, there are some angles where I have to be really careful not to just get my head in the shot all the time. Okay, that's rolling again. All right, now we're gonna install the firmware on the good fit. So this takes advantage of the convenient built-in ROM bootloader on these MSP430 chips. So this Python program is installing all the firmware on this chip just straight from the factory without any special bootloader installation before it uh, reached my board. So I think that's it. And now we actually should be able to talk to this as a face dancer. So we can tell it to be a particular USB device. So for starters, let's just have it be a keyboard. Oh, this one's Python 3. Does it really need Python 3? Uh, I guess I'm gonna take its word for that and assume that it probably wants Python 3, but let's just try this first. No? It's interesting. That seems like maybe the kind of thing that might result from a Python 2 versus 3 incompatibility. So, all right, I guess I'll just install Python 3 on this Mac. That seems like a thing that I want anyway. Can I do that with Homebrew? <laughs> I 
And Tuco doesn't shed super much. I'm, I think I'm pretty lucky about that. But also this place is pretty easy to clean out because the concrete floor is, you know, you can just sweep it or even just hit it with the air compressor and all the cat hair kind of conglomerates together into a single entity. All right, so did that go in my path already? Yay, Python 3. And do I have easy install? Oh, is this like a thing? I don't really know Python. Sure. Oh, maybe I already had that. I guess we can upgrade pip while we're here. Dancer. Let's be a keyboard. Right. Let's be a keyboard using the right serial port. I'm just going to export this. Well, that seems good. So we can't call this 100% working yet because we haven't actually tested the other USB port. But this now means that we've got firmware installed via this serial port on this microcontroller, and it's now successfully talking to this chip, which is being clocked by this crystal. So there's very little left to go wrong here. We just need to test this serial port or USB port and see if we can actually use this device. So another USB cable here. And let's get USB Prober open just so we can see what's connecting. And, you know, you wouldn't necessarily run these, connect these to the same computer most of the time, but you could do it. Oh, wait, I'm trying to break my USB Prober addiction and use IO Registry Explorer. Gotta get with the times here. Oh, there's so much garbage in here, though. How do I clear the garbage? Ah, hide terminated objects. We didn't need you anyway. Kind of a compromise on font size there. Don't actually know how to make IO Registry Explorer bigger. All right. Well, that'll at least show all of what's going on here. So I've not yet plugged it in, but when I plug it in, we should see both the Mac noticing a new USB device, and we should see the face dancer software kind of spewing all the stuff that it's doing verbosely as it answers the requests from the Mac. That was anticlimactic. Maybe I didn't plug this in all the way. Ah. That was still pretty anticlimactic. I wonder if this might just be a hot plug related issue. I'm gonna try, actually before I do anything else, I should try a different cable because sometimes the cables are bad. test this cable with something separately, but I'm just going to plug it in here first. All right, still nothing. Whoops. Let's restart this program just to make sure that isn't necessary. Nope. 
This, oh, actually, I was gonna say this USB hid thing isn't it, because that's my mouse, but actually, I think that's my mouse. I didn't see that plug in, but maybe I just wasn't paying attention. No, if I unplug that, that's still not a thing. What is this USB hid? Uh, that is, I don't think that's mine. Hmm. <laughs> that was my mouse. I need that. Uh, all right, let's swap this cable to the other side just to test that. Maybe the cable isn't good, or the hub. Oh man, I'm just such a magnet for USB problems. It is also possible I have a bad port on that hub and I keep plugging things into it. No? Or this might be the VM getting in the way again. Although I thought we established that VMware grabbing the device meant it still shows up in USB Explorer, at least temporarily. Um, I'm going to shut this off anyway. Yeah, some combination of this cable and this port on the hub are not happy. I'm just going to grab my bin of cables. can go wrong with USB. But it's, I don't know, I find it a satisfying protocol to watch in a hardware analyzer because it's like all that complexity of like, oh, it might be working or it might not. It, you know, if you can actually see the packets, it's a much more calming sort of protocol, I think. Is it just not updating? Is my hub terrible? Okay, I use a different port on the hub and it seems fine. Maybe the top half of this hub is not happy. I'm gonna look into that after the stream. <laughs> All right, so we have two ports here, which should work. I'm gonna verify one works and the other works. Okay, great. Now let's have this be a keyboard again. Oops. All right. Let's try this again. Cameras are good. Is highly anticlimactic. All right, maybe time to get out the scope again and look at what's going on. It was so close to being completely flawless in every way, but we had to find this one terrible problem. <laughs> Open up the O scope again.
totally sure what to expect here without the USB host plugged in, but I'm just kind of curious. Let's just make sure the scope is getting a good signal by probing on power. All right. 10 to 1. All right. So the USB signal does actually have a few places that it could get botched because there are vias on both sides of these 330 ohm resistors. And the resistors could be shorted, although I don't see anything. So. That's kind of an interesting noise pattern, but nothing really. Let's plug this in and see what changes. forget which one of these is supposed to be plus five on the, the mini connector, but it, I assumed it was one of these and I'm not seeing plus five yet. Oh, it's that one and it's totally not soldered. Ha ha ha. I don't think that necessarily would cause this problem, but actually it might because, so this isn't using it for power, but I think it has a way of detecting the, uh, the presence of the host machine by looking at that pin. So that might just need a solder touch up. I think this is the USB connector that's sitting a little oddly because it's got a via underneath it. And I, I was a little lazy on the last stream and didn't uh, sand the top of that via after soldering it again. So it's a little taller than all the rest, which I didn't think would be a big deal. Just go ahead and add a little more solder to all of these while I'm here, since there, it is sitting a little weird on the circuit board. Oh, that's a bridge. Now it's clear. It's like I intentionally want there to be enough solder to form bridges in the Z direction, like vertically to the board, but I don't want this to happen. So I want there to be slightly less solder. This braid is not hot enough. I'm trying to put the cart before the horse, I guess, 
is an expression that people hundreds of years ago might have said. Let's just add more flux, because that doesn't have nearly enough flux. I think really YouTube electronics videos are missing kind of a, a sense of haptics, like if you could feel the solder melting as well as seeing it. You know, you don't need the smell of vision, that, that you can live without, but if you could uh, if you get a sense of the tactility of it all, that might be kind of amusing for folks. Test this again. All right, what what is this third time or fourth time's the charm? Something like that. Which cliche are we on now? All right, so that's the FTDI. And now we get to run the firmware via keyboard now. Oh, wow. Ha. Huh. I don't know if anyone else saw that, but there was like a bright flash that indicated some electricity converted something into vapor. Uh, I think there might have been some conductive debris on that via, which is now melted into little pieces. Well, that was fun. I wonder how much current limiting that crappy USB hub has. Let's try to touch that up and then do some multimeter diagnostics to see what that might have been. I wonder if any of that happened on uh, on video. Oops. Yeah. It was so I wasn't didn't have my eye quite looking directly at it when it happened, but I think that via was not, you know, like a crater before I plugged it in. So, hmm. Well, that looks attached, but let's test that out with the multimeter. Hmm. Oh yeah, so about flux, that's a good question. Let's take a break from this mess and talk about flux. <laughs> let's see, so this is the stuff I've been using a lot. This is uh, Kester 2331ZX flux, flux pin, and yeah, I like this stuff a lot. I wouldn't call myself like a flux connoisseur, but I've used this stuff for a while, and it's quite handy. Um, and there's this other stuff I got pretty recently, um, which, yeah, I showed this earlier, but I'll show it again. Um, and this is just uh, MG Chemicals No Clean this is number 8341. Um, this seems to be pretty good. This was just something that I picked up off of Amazon because I needed a flux in a syringe and this seemed to have good reviews and so far it's been all right. All 
All right, let's see what the damage is. I suspect there was just some conductive debris on the plus five and that not much else is wrong, but this is a good opportunity to check over everything. Since anytime there's, you know, flashes of light or smoke, it's a really good opportunity to check your work. You know, almost as good an opportunity as five minutes before that, uh, that moment. Ground. Oh. Oh, that's that's what blew. That was the copper trace being a fuse right here. This via was a red herring. I think this via was either <laughs> that that might have already been broken or something. But that that little crater is what actually just happened. So I guess the only reason that didn't happen before was the uh, lack of actual 5 volts on this trace. Uh, that's interesting too. This isn't like shorted to, well, I mean, maybe this isn't like a good ground. Um, where is a good ground? Something like like this. Is that connected to this ground? No. Where can I get a good ground? I think that's, I think that's a good ground I can use. is not connected to any of those. I'm going to pull up the PCB layout again and look at how this is supposed to work. <laughs> yeah, there totally might be a short under the USB connector, but um, I mean, the, from, from the way that this wire blew right here, it's acting like this was plus five, ground was connected correctly to ground, and then this was shorted to ground. But this doesn't seem to be shorted to ground, so there's there's gotta be some other explanation in there. Um, I just don't remember which of these is supposed to be what, because the five pins on the USB mini always confused me, so I'm gonna get out the schematic. Okay, so that's that's supposed to be ground up there. And then the via under there was for D plus. That via is D plus and and then this is the V bus comparator, so you shouldn't be powering anything with that, it's just sensing it. So this should just be a GPIO input. And this is the, the line that blew, which is weird. So I'm just going to try to check this out with the multimeter. All right, so that is our ground. It should be... Yeah, cool. So there and not there. Just what we want. And Okay, now that we have a good ground, this is shorter to ground like it seemed like it might be. So well. So that goes over and that goes under here and then kind of out 
to this third pin, I think. Yeah, okay. So let's hope there's some conductive debris on the other side of the board, because if not, there's a short under this chip that caused this to blow. Uh, let's see, while I'm here, I wanna test the USB data pins because these vias don't look amazing and I want to give them some verification. So. Oh, let's get that on the camera. Somewhere over here. Oh, where does that go? D minus. Ah, and D plus. Those are both on bottom of the chip. D minus is the one to the left, that one that has the exposed via. So that should Yep, 33 ohms. All the way there. Cool. And the other one satisfied with those, so this is probably the only problem left, <laughs> she said optimistically. Uh, let's check the other side, try to find that short. bearings around here. So that is not the VCC I'm looking for. It is Yeah. I think that's the problem. Sweet. So that is the via that goes to Vbus, the one that uh, we shorted out. And I think right there is a tiny, tiny milling error where there's a little bit of metal still connecting that. I'm gonna see if I can get higher magnification on this terrible little scope. Whoops. I mean, the scope is not terrible. It's just not very good at high magnification, which is not usually what I need it for. Yeah. So let's see if we can make this a decisive before and after. <laughs> yeah, the problem with this microscope when you zoom in this far is you have very little working distance. All right. And the back side, this big copper pore is actually ground, unlike on the front side where it's just floating. So if this is the only problem, then I should be able to correct it with this knife. Oh, I thought that was a bit of milling debris, but that was actually a solder bridge. I mean, it might have been a solder bridge on top of milling debris. But anyway, let's clean that up with the soldering iron, too. Better for the conductive debris to be stuck down to the board than floating around somewhere, causing more unintentional incandescence. I'm going to 
have some flux join this party. There we go. Seems good. Let me see if I get any resistance, noticeable resistance when I switch to ohms. Ah, sweet, half meg, which is much more like what I, was, I would expect from an IO pin. So, okay, now that we fixed the root cause, now we need to fix the trace that acted like a fuse on the other side of the board, which I, I hope I got that on the SLR. I'm sure I didn't get it under the microscope. That would have been cool. Maybe I should try some intentional destruction under the microscope for fun one of these days. Okay, and this, this working distance is terrible. I need more. That's better. This is not the original stand this microscope came with. It originally, like, this kind of horizontal member is original and this post, but then I, I like flipped it upside down. Normally this attaches to a little base plate, but I flipped it over and then attached it to like a light, a lighting clamp that's connected to the desk on the other end. So it's, it's kind of stable, like it's more stable than if this was on like a separate tripod or something, but it's not as stable as my big metal base that I have for the binocular scope. So this is going to be very delicate. Like I would just normally probably want to clean all the like, cause this, this carbon stuff is conductive and I don't want especially that between the uh, burned out power trace and the kind of potentially ground plane-ish copper next door. Um, this is also going to be a delicate trace, so I might, like, I don't know how much of this I'm gonna be able to save. All right. Now well, that's, there's not much left, but that'll be easy to run a wire through. Yeah, I don't think I want to keep the solder or the copper that's just barely hanging on there because it's just going to be a problem. So I'm just going to remove that trace. <laughs> And that doesn't seem to have much debris. There's kind of some blackened like glue residue under where the trace was, but all right. And as for wire, um, I mean, I could use magnet wire for this. That's probably the most sensible thing to do. Um, just a very, th little run of magnet wire. Okay, I have a little piece here already. So this is, like I showed this spool last time, this is more of, more of the same. Yeah, 32 gauge from OEM wire, but I'm sure there are plenty of places you can find stuff like this. Um, designed for inductors and transformers and electromagnets and things, but super great for rework. Um, and actually for this particular job, I don't necessarily want something insulated, but I don't think I have any totally uninsulated wire that's quite this small, so I'll just deal with the varnish insulation, even though it wouldn't be kind of nice not to have to in this situation.
So I'd be curious if anybody has thoughts on, uh, you know, whether, like what kind of content you want to see on streams specifically, uh, as far as, you know, like if it's just like building stuff and debugging stuff, or if it would be interesting to see like more software kind of stuff too. Because um, for example, the, the step right after getting this working, um, I mean, at that point it kind of branches off and becomes like a different thing for different videos. But when I'm, when I'm turning this into the uh, kind of fake debug dongle for that project, um, it's, it's probably going to be, you know, like, I guess I just don't know how much people want to like stare at me writing code in a text editor. Like, is that actually interesting or, um, you know, maybe, maybe the answer is just to label the streams as well as I can with the expected content. <laughs> And then let people make up their own minds when they when they get the tweet or the notification or whatever. to be really careful with these tweezers because I, I get like a new pair of tweezers that is a really good point and I just want to use it for everything and then the point's not good for very long. So I've got to have my hierarchy of tweezers of various qualities in order to keep the, the points nice when I need them to be nice. And there's, yeah, there's one that's like really bad. This one is currently my, my worst tweezers in need of maybe another ad hoc rebending. Use not the worst tweezers. Let's use the second worst tweezers. I need a new knife blade. This knife blade has had it. Oh, where are my knife blades? Oh, the same thing could really apply with the knife blades, but I don't have nearly the discipline with them. I tend to just be really mean to my knife blades. Oh, this is supposed to have a little thing for used blades, but it's acting like it's full, so whatever. So all this like stuff kind of vertically in the way, like this crystal and to some extent that capacitor. But I think that did it. I want to pull that up off the board just a little bit so I can tin the wire. Tuco is still so peaceful.
<laughs> oh, cool. I'll try to do some some uh, some board design on the stream too. I I've been catching some of uh, Lady Ada's eagle streams, and I really like that kind of thing too. It's super relaxing to kind of have a uh, you know someone working on stuff while you're you know working on stuff or hanging out or whatever. Oh man, this is like it's just shaking a lot because I don't have a great place to rest my hand for this, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't need to be precise. All right, now I can put this back down on the board. And I, I want to tack down, or I want to give the first joint another pass too because that's just barely tacked on there. I wanted to get the other side on and then go back and give that one another tack. I think this is good. Let me do another couple of multimeter checks just to make sure this won't turn into another bit of un uh, unintentional incandescence. But uh, I, have, I have good feelings about this at the moment. The worst kind of feelings. All right, let's get ground. And test the ground. Use this ground. Seeing a good ground. I think this one's supposed to be ground. That's like two megs. What's going on up here? That's a good connection. Okay, so that's a good ground. Is, is that good at all? That is 2.6 mega ohms. That is not good. How about... How did my ground connection become bad all of a sudden? Um, yeah, so... This trace is the one I'm suspicious of right now. I'm getting... Oh, that's under the picture in picture, sorry. Uh, this one up here. So this this ground seems good, but doesn't seem to be connected through to there, which is annoying. Just hit that with the soldering iron and see if that helps. This is so weird. How is that trace not good? It's so short. Okay, let me just make sure the one I just added works before I get sidetracked on making ground suck less. And the, like this would probably work without the ground, at least in the first couple of tests, since I'm plugging both sides into the same USB hub. Um, this should have a connection to, um, where was that going? Ah, to the right. 
to the D plus. So this guy on the Maxim chip should be our USB. That's good. Let's just make this beep again so it's obvious. So that's good. Okay, no short to the neighboring pins. Okay, so that's fine. Maybe now the only remaining problem is the ground, as I've said that for like the eighth time. Uh, I mean, it would be easy enough just to run a jumper wire around that, but I'm, I want to know why this isn't, isn't good. Like, did I break that trace under the connector somehow? Let's see if we can get a better angle. see it all the way back to you know around there oh let's unzoom this yeah so there there's the ground coming in and I can yeah, see it get through about there but huh so then I can see the copper pad here which still seems to be connected but, like, I'm wondering if this is just a cold solder joint. Like, maybe, or maybe the copper pad is split, like, under where the solder joint is, and it's only connecting to the side closest to me, not the side that's actually grounded. So, I'm going to see if I can add a little more heat and flux and see if that helps. This is definitely one of those things where, you know, you're, you would choose a different adventure depending on uh, what your goals were. Like, if you just wanted this to work, you would totally just not think twice about adding a wire and it wouldn't be a problem. But if you were, like, debugging a design that you intend to fabricate, then, you know, it's more of a mixed bag. You would probably just add the wire if you're confident that it's just a prototyping mishap. But if you don't have that confidence, then maybe it's more important to diagnose what's actually going on. And in this case, I think it's some of that, but also just me being a perfectionist and wanting to know what's going on. Oh, there's hair cam. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's so much lag between changing the pressure on the syringe and any motion of the flux because it's so thick. All right. Did that help? <laughs> no, it did not help. Okay, so I am curious why this isn't working, so I'm going to take this connector off and then we can fix it and put it back on because that's totally a thing that we can do. So for that, that does require hot air, which I have right here. So let's do some hot air desoldering. And
should be good. This microscope is pretty close for this, but that's fine. It's possible that little stranded wire I added is going to be displaced by this process, but it'll probably be fine. Um, more flux would help though. I think we've got enough around the data pins, but a little bit of flux around this area would be helpful. I don't want to get too much like in the connector. <laughs> okay. Cute little daub of flux over there. These are super handy if you haven't uh, encountered these before. They're basically just temperature controlled hot air guns. Not too dissimilar from like a hardware store paint stripper, but with a nice thermostat and usually a much lower flow rate. I'm trying to avoid heating any one spot for too long, just because that is more likely to damage the circuit board. Or, you know, I would worry about damaging other components, but there isn't much on this part of the board. So now it's getting hot enough that the flux is starting to smoke a little. And I think I see the start solder starting to go. didn't answer my question. How was that ground not connected? <laughs> Man, okay. Man, Tuco doesn't care. Tuco, Tuco's still sleeping through this mystery. <laughs> huh. <sighs> well. <laughs> Oh, I love how evenly the solder flows when the whole thing is just coated with flux like this. Even that wire blends in pretty nicely. All right, well, that's really confusing because I don't see any breaks whatsoever in this. I'm gonna like touch up these edges in case there's a like a little hairline crack somewhere. Man. Okay, let's give that the multimeter test again. All right, so get our old reliable ground again I've been using. So the problem's at this side. I guess I could have fixed that without removing the, con the connector. I'd have known. I guess this via, the, the ring separated from the trace a little bit. Let's see if we can get a better angle. Oh, there's a tiny, tiny crack. Let's see if I can zoom in. I 
You can kind of see it, but now that I'm holding it by hand, it might be shaking too much. Let's see if I can brace it on something. Yeah, yeah, you see the break? It's right there. It's huge. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can hit that with the soldering iron while I have it under the scope without burning all of my fingers off. sufficient. Try this again and see if we get ground. If so, well, at least now we'll have the opportunity to. Ooh, that's really sticky. <laughs> Let's not touch that to find out how sharp it is because it's so sticky. But I think um, I think I could maybe sand down that via a little bit, but it's probably not worth worrying about. I mean, I could put on a fresh connector. Often that would be preferable if you can, but like, yeah, this connector looks fine. I'm just gonna put the same one back on. And if you were soldering it onto a nice clean flat board, you'd wanna kind of dress up the contacts on the connector a bit, but because the board itself is also pretty regular, then the two options are basically either to just put it on like this and hit it with the hot air tool again and let it reflow, um, or we could just manually solder it like we have been. And so I'm gonna manually solder this one because I think I can just try to correct the tilt by hand while I'm soldering the first pin. Using these tweezers, or not those tweezers, those tweezers are much too good for this. Use these. So yeah, I think just putting a little bit of angle on it while I solder that first pin will give it will help it out. is floating a little high. That's soldered though. All right. Yeah, there's a little bit of a gap between the connector and the board on that side because of the via underneath, but it is within my tolerance for caring. So I think it'll be fine, especially with these all soldered and sturdy to the board. I need to find a way to have the picture-in-picture -picture views move around sometimes because 
I'm a little worried now that all my microscope footage is going to have the action like skewed left to uh, to dodge the the overlays. Let's touch up these data pins, and then maybe it's time to give this thing another go. I think those could use a little more solder to fill in this gap. Sometimes with all these reflections and stuff going on, it can be kind of hard to tell what's solder and what's liquid. And That's another thing that having a, a stereoscope can help with. I've been curious whether there's a good way to share that experience of having a stereo microscope over YouTube. Like it would be really cool if you could use some kind of real-time 3D reconstruction from two cameras and a binocular scope and then have this thing that you could kind of, you know, pan the camera around in a little bit to give it a sense of depth, or even like broadcast it in VR or something. All right, I'm gonna test those with the multimeter also because it's a little ambiguous visually. Oh, hey, Tuco. <laughs> I couldn't tell whether he was stretching or reaching for me specifically. I feel you, little guy. Okay, I'm relatively satisfied that this won't catch on fire when I plug it in. Seems like a good place to start. All right. All right, back to this thing where we're trying to be a keyboard. Be a keyboard. So there's the FTDI again, and run the script. The script is going to start trying to be a keyboard whenever it's plugged into something, and now we plug it into something. see nothing, which is certainly better than catching on fire. All right. And try some oscilloscopery. catching on fire or anything. And that doesn't look like USB. These are both appearing to be at zero. Yeah, I don't know whether, uh, I don't know whether that is a condition that you might expect if the firmware wasn't programming the Max 232 successfully. 
because normally a USB host controller, <clears throat> it won't start trying to talk until a device electrically identifies its speed by turning on some pull-up resistors. And so that's actually a thing that the max, um, whatever this maximum chip is, 3421EE or whatever it's called, um, that this one would have internally and you'd, you'd program it to do that. So, what is next? Well, one option would be to look at it from kind of a USB analyzer point of view, but I suspect that's just gonna tell us there's nothing there because if I'm seeing these, like I think as far as I'm seeing on the scope, both D plus and D minus are hovering at ground, which is not a useful place for them to be. So I'm testing my scope with the VCC over here, which I'm getting five volts. And then, yeah, nothing there. Nothing there. I'm going to try running this program again, just in case, like I don't think it's the case that you need to run this after there's already a, de a device present or a host present on the USB adapter, but just in case. No, oh, it's acting like it doesn't see anything. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, let's clean off some of that flux while thinking about what to text, test next. And I let the chat computer fall asleep again. <laughs> All right. A uh, fresh stick. Sure was an interesting sequence of problems. Yeah, could that have broken anything? I doubt it. I mean, it seemed like that was a pretty straightforward short from five volts to ground without going through any other components along the way. So I would expect that for its only casualty to be the actual bit of copper that blew out. But I mean, and not having a good ground could cause problems, like on the data lines. If, for example, you know, you had a large potential difference in ground between this device and the computer you're plugging this into, and the ground isn't actually connected, now you see that potential difference across this circuit's ground and the USB pins, which is bad for the USB transceiver. Um, but that wouldn't have had any opportunity to happen in this case because I'm plugging both sides into the same USB hub. So their grounds are basically the same. You know, other than small variations caused by current flowing through the actual USB cables. Ah. And if there were communications failing between the microprocessor and the Maxim chip here, we'd be seeing a different kind of failure. You know, we wouldn't be seeing it say hello successfully. Um, I guess I could try one of the other face dancer scripts and see if it gives me any more diagnostic information. All right, those are both plugged in again. I guess it could be the connector. One thing I could check for Hmm. Because there there won't be any signals on on the USB like upstream bus unless the hub knows there's something plugged in. Um, so it would need that that resistance to be on. Um, yeah, I guess I would expect the device. Like I think the, I'm trying to remember the polarities here. I think when the device is operating, it pulls uh, one or both of the D plus D minus lines up to or two 3.3 volts um, using like some tens of kilo ohms or something. So if the Maxim chip was doing that successfully, I would expect to see some voltage other than zero on, you know, on the USB lines right here at these resistors, which I'm not seeing. So maybe, you know, this could still be like 
problem between keyboard and chair. I'm just using the software wrong or something. <clears throat> Let's see. Could I have this be something else, like an FTDI? No. I mean, when when this gets transfers from the USB hosts, it'll it'll start printing them out, and so it doesn't look like it's doing the right thing yet. I mean, we could try this with one of the working boards just to be sure. Um, this one. I think I've already put firmware on this one. Oh, hey, Tuco. Um, is that it? Yeah. Different serial port. And let's have it be a keyboard again. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So our board, whoops, our board was getting to this, oh, that's weird. My mouse keeps hanging because I guess this device takes a while to respond to requests and it's causing the Mac OS USB stack on this computer to kind of freeze every so often. So that would be a good reason to plug this, this into not the same computer, perhaps, because computers often expect USB devices to respond and this particular USB device operates at the speed of Python code. So, I also don't know why this seems to be continuously resetting the device. So all these different set addresses would indicate that the computer keeps failing to enumerate and trying again. So that also could be something specific to this USB hub. But in any case, this is working better than our board was. Well. It's also possible that, I mean, at this point, it seems like it's likely a relatively subtle problem with the USB data lines. Like, they, you know, might be shorted in a way I just haven't noticed so far. Or maybe that via that's barely holding on is actually not any good. Actually, maybe I can take a look at the USB coming straight out of the Maxim chip with the scope, because I would kind of expect to see the pull-ups going on there. So just to be sure, this is where I was testing before and I got zero, zero. So I think this is one of the USB pins, I'm also getting zero. This one, such zero. Maybe I can verify whether this is even like a useful test on the other board. Because I guess I would expect to see if I plug this in and have it run the keyboard program, but not plug in the target port, then I should expect to see, I mean, I think 3.3 volts on those, those same pins. So let's see what we get. <laughs> world of difference on a board with solder mask. So. All right, 
be in a keyboard. And we need ground. So I'll just grab case ground off of this. All right. So it might also be that it doesn't enable its pull-ups until it detects VBus. I don't know. All right, here's one of the USBs. So without the target plugged in, I'm also reading zero here. Yeah. And if I do plug in the target, I'll see what it looks like really plug this into a Raspberry Pi or something. All right, I'm getting the set address requests again. And now I'm getting 3.3 volts. Yeah. And it's probably not just 3.3 volts. We've probably got packets on here if we look closely. Or maybe not. Maybe that's not happening yet. We wouldn't be seeing packets right away if this is a low speed device. I don't know what speed this is emulating. Yeah, we've got an idle state of 3.3 volts on one of the pins and zero volts on the other. Which, I guess it could be either a low speed device or a full speed device in a power management mode where it isn't getting start of frame packets. So, I'm just gonna do some multimeter probing of the USB D plus and D minus because that seems like where the problem is. So actually this will be easier if I get a little USB connector to plug it into also. Tuco cam anymore. Tuco is wandering around. Where is Tuco? <laughs> hey, Tuco. All right. USB cable. the beeps turned off. All right, so this is just VUSB. And right there. So that's plus five. Other side will be ground.
might be a problem. I think that data line, oh, maybe I just wasn't touching it hard enough. Ah, bad solder joint. That pin is wiggling. There we go. Totally the last problem. <laughs> All right, let's just reflow those pins and yeah, great. Oh yeah, I'd love to have some way of automatically following Tuco around the shop with a camera, that'd be great. Um, yeah, really it's just down to what he would wear. I mean, if he's, he totally is fine with wearing collars and I could even imagine something that, because I've got the Lighthouse Space Station here for the, the HTC 5 and it doesn't cover the whole shop, but it covers like probably half of it and like the area near here probably. So I can imagine, um, you know, if he, could wear a collar with, that at least had some kind of small like wireless transmitter and sensor for those location beacons, then like that would require battery charging, but it would give really accurate position. But I could also imagine something with just like, you know, a collar that has a pattern the camera can recognize, and maybe that works fine too. Or even just, you know, there's probably a way of recognizing Tuco without having him wear anything, too. There's a little tail there that I have to corral. Give those a, a little push. The back side of a knife. This is another one of those problems that is, um, like it, it, it'll occur much with uh, much easier if you have stuff under the chip like like I do on this board. If you're designing something specifically where you want it to be easy to assemble prototypes of, but you also want it to be use it, you know compatible with all the standard PCB processes, then you can just make little changes like you know being sure you don't place vias under chips um, that oftentimes don't require much additional PCB design hardship, but they can help a lot in the prototyping stage. Where's Tuco? Oh, I don't see him. When I see him, I'll point the camera at him. <laughs> all right, back to the computer for hopefully a working test after all this. <laughs> Tis the way prototyping is. All right. So we got that plugged in again. Oh, is that not the right device? Yeah. Be a keyboard. No, oh, it's not obviously working here. Right, let's plug in the other end of this USB cable. No? Did we decide this port was working? All right, maybe, uh, let's actually do that continuity check test before jumping to conclusions.
seems fine. What else could I be doing wrong? Let's double check all this USB stuff. Swap these USB cables so that we know that they're both good. There's the FTDI thing. Oh, let's also quit these VMs just in case the VMs are a problem. And there's the O-scope coming back. All right. Be a keyboard. All right. Nothing. Tukes upstairs, I can hear him using the litter box. Okay, got the scope again. This is connected, running the keyboard script, just not really working yet. So, see if any of this is new. This was the VUSB sense pin. Should be five. Oh. Every time I start the scope, I have to run the change the settings again. It doesn't it doesn't seem to like remembering settings. Alright, there's the five. Those are USB packets. Those are also USB packets. Wow. At least I think so. Let's zoom in and take a closer look. Let's try doing that with the other hand. You know, I thought we were just seeing some USB packets. I mean, it's possible that was my scope probe moving around, but it looked much more regular than that. Let's try restarting this in case it's timing out in some way. Oh yeah, those are USB packets. This controller's trying, but I don't think we're getting the message. So, I mean, I wonder if this is a partial communications failure between the Maxim chip and the MSP430. I should check out all the communication lines between them, because maybe what's going on now is the voltage levels are right, but like maybe there's like an interrupt pin that isn't necessarily needed for initialization, but now that we're in the main kind of loop of the program, not getting the interrupt signals maybe would cause this problem. So let's see if the schematic supports any of those conjectures.
Yeah, this interrupt pin may be... So this would be a good time to double check all of these connections. Seems like that's the most likely cause for this kind of a problem. Yeah, I mean, this this is almost certainly just like a, a pin that isn't connected. And it's probably one of those things that is, is caused by things not sitting flat because of the vias. But let's see if we can get an edge on view of this board. Seem alright. So if the interrupt pin is the problem. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought I was on the microscope. The interrupt pin is uh, this one here, fourth from the left. That's a good solder joint, it looks like. And all the ones on this side look fine. Then Tuco, do you want to play? Tuco wants to play. I think we should do that, but my hands are covered in flux, so I'm going to wash my hands really quick and then throw the bolt for Tuco. Threaded parts and the other part. Hey, Tuco. Oh, here's one. Yeah, that's a good bolt. You can trust that one. Good job, boy. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> wow. A little goalie cat. <laughs> Hiding behind that bin of USB cables. Good 
Good job, little guy. I think maybe the next, the next debugging step is probably just to take a look at the, the signals between the two chips on the O-scope. That might be the best indication. And I mean, it, it does seem kind of futile sometimes to be, you know, doing debugging on a board that's practiced like this one or like for demo purposes. But it's really the same techniques you would use on something brand new, but without the, all the other problems that you have in debugging something that's, that's never worked before. So I, I find it an interesting exercise. But to me, it feels a lot like kind of taking things apart and putting them back together again to, uh, to kind of understand the process. Hey, Tuco, was that one really hard? I, didn't, I don't remember where that one went. Yeah? Do you want another one? I think there's another one over here. Good job, Tuke. Good job, little dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love how confident he is once he's got the bolt. Like, yep, I got it. It's tasty. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put it here. Boy. And then sometimes I'll try to pet him to like be like, oh man, Tuke, that was great. And I'll reach in to pet him and he's like, no, I just want you to throw it again. Yeah, the face dancer is kind of slow. It's it's not something you would want to use for, you know, anything where bandwidth is a concern and, and even sometimes it can be, you know, like a challenge to evade timeouts if you, if you have to get some driver to initialize before it decides the hardware is broken, for example. I mean, USB is one of those weird protocols where kind of theoretically it has this layer where you know, like the lowest levels of USB ha ha are very chatty. Like they, they expect responses very quickly and they send a bunch of kind of useless packets and expect responses very quickly even if there's nothing really to say. So at the very lowest levels, USB would be kind of annoying to add additional latency or like network transparency to. But just like a couple levels above that in the protocol, like where you'd be writing drivers or applications, once you're dealing with like USB requests, and bulk transfers, and interrupt requests, and things like that. Then, then you actually have a lot less latency tolerant, or kind of a lot less requirements for things to be uh, very low latency. Are you done done with that, Tuka? All right. Maybe let's take a look at these traces under the oscilloscope. Oh, it'd be a shame if we didn't get to get this working tonight. 
but that is totally allowed and we can always come back to it. Signals. Looks like they would all be pretty easy to grab on this side of the processor. Oh, ha! Okay, I don't think I really need any more footage from that camera tonight, so I won't worry about dumping the card just yet. Uh... Alright. To go. Let's put that back. I guess I need a view that has the computer and the microscope side by side. I keep wanting that. All right, that'll have to do for now. Really, I just want all the pixels. Like if the streaming machine wasn't already so low on CPU, it would be cool to just make everything 4K and just have like camera views all over, but. As it is, I have to scale the resolution down a lot just to keep this computer from lagging behind. All right, let's actually make sure this script is running. All right. So. Seeing some occasional clock activity on there. That's nice. So, this is Miso, Master In, Slave Out. Not seeing much there. Well, this one's fine, Master Out, Slave In. Maybe I'm getting something. So this, yeah, this doesn't look like a signal. This looks like noise. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, that doesn't look right. <laughs> okay, what the hell is that? So that might just not be connected or something. So... Or it might be shorted to something. Weird. Yeah. Huh. That's CS. Which, <laughs> having those two different levels for one definitely seems like an issue unless this is a bidirectional serial line, which it isn't, right? This is, uh, yeah, this is supposed, oh, hmm, this is supposed to be, this is master out slave in, this is Mosi. seeing a different thing here versus there. That also seems like a soldering issue. Okay, let's just try reflowing that side of that chip. Such reflow, very solder. Oh, maybe I will swap out that card just in case. I think I've gotten a very empty one. All right, 
that if I need it. I mean, it'd be nice to have that view when this finally works. All right. Let's get fluxy. Let's just make sure there's plenty of solder on here. <laughs> Are you conductive debris trying to ruin my day? Get out of there. Oh, my trace just turned into conductive debris. Oh, that happens sometimes. <laughs> Great. And building one thing and manufacturing things are so different. Like just the, it's not even like operating at the same level. It's like making a process and the individual things are, are kind of inconsequential as long as the process produces things reliably. That is some delicate copper. All right, well, I guess I have to repair that. Mm. Don't know if that top one is good, but the bottom one is definitely not. Where are you, Duke? Oh, there you are. Got a shadow of the Tuco cam, too. My row. All right, some more little magnet wire. What's up, Tuco? Actually, for, a, for something this short, I'm just gonna tin an especially long section and then cut off the tin section. Realizing I don't think I've shown the tinning process under the microscope on this stream and it's fun, so let's do that. Hey, Tuco. He think, I think he wants to play still. Now I keep losing track of where he, am. he is. It's like he, he gets my attention and then immediately disappears. Is that a cat hair right next to the wire? It is like the tiniest cat hair. It's not even a regular size one.
Oh, the surface tension is strong with this. A little more. <laughs> that might be enough. I kind of wanted more, though. Let's check it out. Oh, that's fine. stuck to my flush cutters. A very tiny piece of wire that I want. The place my tweezers want to be is also the place my microscope focus knob wants to be. other end was not tacked down as well as I thought it was. Oh no, I think it might have broken that other trace along the way. Okay, maybe at this point I use a longer piece of wire and then cut it down. <sighs> All right. Yeah, well you just take you take one step forward and then like three quarters of a, of a step back and then like a half step sideways. And then you make it a dance.
Uh, it's possible tinning a longer piece of wire is easier with a torch. Let me try that. Let's see if this works. That was faster. Yeah, much better. Should be easier to tin now. I don't know if that actually makes it easier to tin. That might have just burnt the insulation, but not actually exposed much of the wire. I think maybe the right way to do that is a solder pot, but I don't really feel like warming up my solder pot right now. So I'll just tin a small bit here. And then, hey Tuco. A little too much solder on there. Traces. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. 
test that bridge really quick before going further. That end is not actually soldered. Ah, that's what I was worried of. Let's put that back. when the wire is beside the pin when I want it to be on top. This mechanics are not on your side, it just wants to stay there. soldered on both sides. Oh, still no. Huh. Maybe there's a little break there that I'm not seeing or something. Hard to tell. Maybe a slightly longer wire would have helped. Oh, I can always use that for the other pin. There's some surface tension pulling that everywhere except where I want it to be. So let's change tactics and use this for the other one. I 
bend this slightly so that it follows the trace. Something like that. Where did it go? Here it is. Uh, amazing how far those things can fly. And then they just end up in your foot eventually, as all tiny wires do. It's not the same piece of wire. <sighs> I mean, maybe I should just be working with longer pieces and tack one side down and cut it. I'm just trying to avoid being really, putting a lot of strain on this, but I guess the pins on the chip are sturdy enough that I can use that technique. Just need a tin, a little bit more wire. And It doesn't feel like the greatest joint. I think that's barely soldered on there. Um, I'm gonna try to get it slightly better after I mechanically anchor this with some blue tack. In fact, maybe with that anchored, I can even just solder both sides and then just trim off the excess.
Uh, I keep fussing with that because the solder is not behaving well, but I think I just need to add more flux. No video? Is anybody else having uh, having video problems? All right, that seems better. Let's see if we can trim off the tail. Tuko, hey little cat. Let's not cut my wrist in half. Okay, that looks kind of messy, but yeah. I mean, it's probably fine. I need to add another wire, <laughs> but I mean, I might try to hit that with an iron and some more flux to clean it up. But I think first priority is the next wire. After maybe cleaning some of that extra solder off. Hey, Tuco. You still want to hang out, Duke? Arr Ooh. What's all that about? Oh, I feel you, Duke. Meow. Are you trying to tell me that this is... What are you trying to say? I don't know. I don't even know how you feel about this situation other than wanting to play and probably, you know, also wanting food at some point. Okay. That's a relief. So. There's also... It's also better. So, Do you think anybody juggles under the microscope? Like with little tweezers and tiny bowling pins? Like I find microscope work really fun. I can almost imagine there being like a microscope circus or something. They just do silly things under the microscope to amuse people.
liked it. Alright, I was asking for that. I think I'm also going to need to check the other side of this via to make sure that it's still sufficiently connected enough. Like with wire and not just with a puddle of solder. In fact, I should probably put a fresh wire through the via because the wires that are left in there after sanding are so little that they don't really connect to much. So let's just put this through. It's also possible there's enough still in there that I, like there's enough solder on the other side of the hole that it's not gonna clear out. So with the holes not being placed,
So I think we might be back. Are we getting audio? Oh, we have sound. Okay, I think I figured out what happened. So I thought that the problem was with OBS, and so I restarted OBS. Um, but I think all the tracks on Ableton had suddenly lost their record um, indicator, which, oh, is it out of sync? Oh, yeah, hmm. Do we have, do we have any kind of synchronization going on? Etu, yeah, Etuko really wants to play. Hey, little guy. Anyway, okay, it doesn't think, awesome. So I think, I think the problem is I need to lock my computer that runs Ableton before I start my stream, because I think Tuco walked across the keyboard and turned off the audio tracks. <laughs> is, Ableton was still running, but the record indicators had gotten turned off, which meant that it was no longer outputting audio to the, to the streaming thing, and yeah. My setup here is complicated, and there appear, apparently are lots of ways that Tuco can walk on it. All right, but we were close to having something. I think, did I just get that, did I just get that hole clear, or was I working on that? I think I was still working on getting the hole clear. Yeah, put that back in here. Man, so, so these two traces that I, I'm trying to, reconnect without making too much worse. I think one of them is good, even though it's hard to tell in this light, because it looks like that isn't necessarily connected, but I think that's good. It tested out with the multimeter at least. Um, flashlight might help, actually. Yeah, so that connection seems fine. Um, the other one is totally gone, so I need to clear out that hole so that I can run the wire through it. <laughs> I'm glad Tuco Cam has been working out. Yeah, maybe I can get it closer. I put it on the longest wire I could manage without USB dropping out. I don't know what this is hanging up on. It definitely feels like there is an obstruction. Okay, I just caught some interlacing artifacts out of the corner of my eye. And then OBS said it was bogging a little bit, but now it seems to be climbing back up to 30 frames a second. Ah, computers. Yeah, sure is CPU intensive doing all this streaming. This, this this ridiculous little bit of wire hanging on by nothing. <laughs> Great. So now let's put some magnet wire in there. Some good magnet wire that I haven't burned up. This one. From this angle, the wire is pretty much invisible, but it's totally there. <laughs> you can kind of tell the 
pad is trying its best to escape from the circuit board now. Okay, I think that's secure. It's not really pretty, but it'll do. <laughs> yeah, I definitely need to get some more tiny solder. I actually had a spool of, oh man, I I forget what it was, but it was close to 0.5 millimeters. I think it might have been 0.4 or 0.6 or something along those lines. Um, and yeah, I actually used up that entire spool. That was like, it takes a while to use up an entire spool of solder, but, uh, and then this stuff I have is, so this is labeled 0.3 millimeters, uh, the stuff I'm using right now. But yeah, I thought the stuff I had before was smaller than this, so maybe it was like 0.15. But yeah, this the 0.3 is still pretty good. That's that's 0.3 millimeters under the microscope. It's, I have a ruler here. Maybe we can get some scale. Um, so these ticks are half millimeters. So yeah, a little less than a half millimeter. Seems plausibly 0.3. These are full millimeters. Aren't millimeters enormous? Like, for this kind of electronics work, like, I, I encountered this first with PCB layout because, it, like, then it's not really even especially tangible. It's just, you know, shapes on a, on a computer screen. And then you look at the units and, oh, a millimeter, that's enormous. And then you start doing that in person, and it's kind of the same experience, but now in real life. Hey, boy. You're climbing all over me. What do you want, little guy? We'll have to do another fetch break soon. Okay. So I'm going to kind of make it follow the traces path, even though that's not totally necessary. Give this some room and tin it. And bond it to the chip pin without having to worry about whether there's actually a trace underneath it. I, mean, I was planning all this other stuff to do on the stream in case we finished this project, but this one has turned out to throw some curveballs. I mean, that's a lot of what I was doing before this stream actually was getting stuff ready so that after this board works, I have all the next things lined up. But, you know, that'll be useful anyway. Let's make sure this is fluxed. Actually, I want to tin this slightly better. I'm not happy with this tinning job. Meow. Meow. This little tiger has some sharp parts to him. Oh, that seems like it might have melted the via on the other side. Probably should not have trimmed the other side of the, the wire before doing this part. Oh, what is that? Ah, oh, 
What is that doing here? Oh, I'm really not liking the lighting angles on the microscope right now. There's a little too much contrast to see what's going on. Oh, this is probably going to be bad. But I need to get this off. Sure, it needs more flux too, but uh... okay. This is not going especially well. <laughs> I've, I've certainly had reworks go better than this. Refraction is actually kind of confusing in some of these places. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can solder the other side of this wire before coming back to put the other vertical wire back in. <sighs> okay, it's easier to see what's going on when you have kind of a 3D view. So. That was going all right, except it is not really sitting completely in the board right now. So maybe there's an easy fix here. I don't have a good heat sink object. Yeah, like a little hemostat would be nice um, if it was small enough not to just rip the wire apart. Um, my iron right now, so it, it's measured in Fahrenheit and I can't do the conversion super quickly, but it's at like 720 Fahrenheit. Maybe slightly hotter than I usually. I think I usually run it around 700. I don't know why I had it turned up. Tuco, 
I feel ya on my shirt. Okay, we've got a little wire there. That'll do. I'm just gonna hold it at an angle while I work on this. Uh, flux pen. Somewhere exists a flux pen. Here it is. Oh, Tuco wants to play Bolt. Tuco pretty much always wants to play Bolt when he's awake. Pushing that through slightly. I just want to put a little bit of blue tack on that to hold it down while I try to get the other side to adhere. So delicate. And I've got flux all over my finger again. I'm always inadvertently touching stuff that has flux on it. salvaging this or do I just need a new wire? Oh, no, there it is. Okay. I just need a steeper angle. There is a thing there. The solder is doing a really lousy job of sticking to the wire right now. I mean, that's probably connected, but just barely. I think it needs more flux. Seems all right. Like there's not a lot of solder there, but the solder that is there is making a good fillet. Let's add a little more. This angle is not doing me favors. That the solder are trying to run off. I think it's like it's not filling the hole, but I think there's enough of a fillet on the edge that I'm not going to worry too much, too much about that, as long as it passes the multimeter test. Oh, 
Okay, let's put the other wire back on. What's up, Tuco? idea of tinning the wire with the torch. It would have been fun if it worked. I mean, not tinning, obviously, but like burning off the insulation. But, you know, maybe if I somehow had the torch running in an otherwise inert atmosphere. <laughs> maybe if it was a torch that also sprayed flux. try to use the same technique and just have a long wire that I use as a handle but tin kind of a long bit at the end to use as the actual jumper. That one did like a 720 in the air. Somebody with a high speed camera could probably get some good videos of wire flying through the air as it reacts to seemingly insignificant forces. There's some conductive debris. That, that bit right there is not helping. All right. So that needs some solder. so much better with this light though. Why? Clearly I need yet another like light stand kind of thing to hold this. Actually. That might have done it. That might be it. Get the multimeter. <sighs> uh, MacBook Air. Uh, no, I don't really have a... a... MacBook Air hasn't really been my main machine for a while. Um, and yeah, light, light horizontally is definitely good for like bringing out details, I just don't have a great way of holding it right now, and I don't want, 
You know, I don't necessarily want all the light to be at that angle because a lot of the light is more for the wide angle shots. But yeah, if I had like a, just a little like work light on a gooseneck kind of thing that I could put right here, that would help a lot. So I'll probably figure out a way to set something like that up easily. Like I have little gooseneck clamp things that take quarter 20 threads at the end. And I might just like stick some kind of LED board on that or something. Or maybe just get one of those, I think Ikea has these little LED lamps that are basically that for like $5. All right. Um, all right, so this one. On the schematic, the symbol for the processor matches its uh, layout on the board, but the other one is kind of more, you know, the USB chip is kind of more, um, like the way it's laid out is kind of more functional. So it's grouped according to what kind of pins do what. <laughs> anyway, which pin am I even dealing with? Okay, couldn't even see the pin one dot. There was so much flux goop. Um, all right, pin 12 is the one with the wire going into the via. And is that right? That's reset. Oh man, where does that one even go? Uh, there's a that goes to a GPIO pin. Twenty-six. So it should go to this this one that kind of has the little L-shaped trace attached to it. Great. And not the neighbors. Okay, so the next one be 13. That is the SPI clock. So that pin that has a little wire bridge is the SPI clock and it goes obviously right over here. Let's give this another test. I mean, I won't say I'm feeling lucky, but it seems like the thing to do. Okay, 
back to this scenario where we plug things in and see if stuff works. So, FTDI, that shows up. And the other wire is this one. Running the script. Oh. Huh. That's different. Yeah, now the device is dropping off the bus when I plug the other one in. <laughs> Okay, plug in. Hmm. Well, it's not doing that without the script running. Do this. Oh, now it's working. You know, I wonder if that was just a weirdness from having this plugged into the same USB hub. Because I, I think something weird is happening with macOS's USB stack right now because, and, and the other board was doing it, this, doing the same thing, so I don't think it's a hardware issue, but like the device is continuously resetting. And every time it does that, my mouse, which is plugged into the same USB hub, briefly glitches. So I think this might mean the hardware is good, and that glitch is unrelated. Um, I think maybe the best way to test this would just be to plug the other one into a different computer. And I have, let's see, I might have to check this out of Git, but I have a little script that um, I got from somebody else's face dancer fork and then modified yet more, which uh, just lets you type on a keyboard emulated with the face dancer. So, yeah, yeah, this was somebody else's x -Ary. They made face dancer utils with some useful doodads. And that'll be a fun way to test this if it does indeed work. So. needs a path, yeah. So, good fit. I might just install this stuff. Uh, actually, I don't want to do that, because, well, fine. I was worried about messing up the Python, the system Python install, and I don't have like a, a separate sandbox or anything, but Python 3, I'll just install it system-wide for Python 3. A normal thing for that though. Maybe they don't have a setup tool thing. Is there a make file? Okay, maybe I'll just point my Python path at that. Uh, these these scripts I'll use the the, the Python tools that come with uh, the face dancer. Uh, stuff in the good good vet repository. So let's just try that. Python path. Oh, let's make this stop dinging because that's annoying everybody. Hey, Tuco. Um, yeah, where's the option for that? Visual bell or something like that. Oh, only when sound is muted. Yeah, we want that always. No. Okay, I'll fix that later. 
I probably have to apply to some profile or something. Client, okay. So if this is working, then if I plug this into some other machine, like say the laptop that has the YouTube chat, And I think that's working. So I have that uh, face dancer plugged into the machine with the YouTube chat, and I just typed a bunch of highs into it, and those came out. So, oh, and there, there's somebody, somebody likes the dings, Justin likes the dings. <laughs> oh, I think this might be, uh, I mean, maybe aside from a little bit of flux cleaning off, because this thing is super fluxy, but I think this might be a good time to wrap it up for tonight. So after, after a lot more fussing than I thought was even possible for a board of this size, we have finally got this thing responding, despite a couple of traces getting mangled and another trace acting like a fuse. Um, yeah, I'm pretty satisfied with the eventual success of this thing. cleaning. Maybe I'll even use a fresh stick. Well, thanks so much for joining the stream tonight, everyone. I'll be trying to do these more regularly, so definitely let me know what you like, what you didn't like. Um, if you've got suggestions, you, know, you can leave them in the video comments uh, when it's archived, or let me know on Twitter. That's uh, usually the most reliable way of getting my attention. And yeah, let me know what, what you like, and I'll try to keep doing these as often as I can. Um, I've been trying to get this set up so that I can just like film as much of my kind of everyday operations as possible and get as much of that as I can edited into videos. Um, and so lately, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff I've been doing for my day job is stuff that I can't release right away because we're, you know, we don't want to. Uh, put vulnerabilities out there uh, without having the appropriate fixes in place. But, uh, you know, modulo that, you know, I think me and my new employer are pretty into uh, kind of having public videos of the stuff that I do there too. So I'm pretty excited. And so I've been recording video uh, of that project that I can't release immediately, but I've been, it's nice to actually have, have all that in stock so that I can, uh, put together some nice uh, walkthroughs of the process after it all leads somewhere or not. All right. Let's get some uh, nice shots of the final product here. Still kind of wet. So the board, the board is going to oxidize in this state and kind of go back to looking grody again in a bit. Um, I'm going to go look. Yeah, I don't think it's it's a good idea to start doing that uh, at this point in this video. It's already like midnight here, but um, yeah, I I think I might even have some conformal coding stuff that we can use on this. And if not, my backup plan is to just mask off the connectors with more capped on tape and just spray paint the thing. Is that at least prevents the corrosion, even if it isn't the most durable coating. Oh, let's see if we have any... Uh, can we finish this up with a game of fetch with Tuco, maybe? Hey, Tuco. I'm going to wash the flux off my hands, and then we can play a little bit of fetch. Find one. You're a lot better at finding them than I am. 
Oh, there's one under my desk. This is probably something you put there while I was working to get my attention that failed. Oh, why are we so blurry? Hey, Tuco. Oh man, I don't know why Tuco Cam decided to be amazingly blurry. We can have a super blurry game of fetch. Is the autofocus confused? Meow. Oh, there we go. You two go. How do you confuse the autofocus? in here. Maybe I'll have some tea and make some toast. Got to go. Get some sleep. Get up tomorrow and make more things. Happy boy coming back with the bolt. Good job, Tuco. Tuco started fetching these plastic bolts um, kind of around the same time I moved into this place. And I had a bunch of these for an art project I was working on at the time. And when I was moving, my stuff was much more of a mess than usual. And Tuco found the bag of bolts and just on his own figured out that they were fun if you kind of bat them around. And then he realized that he could bring them to me and I would throw them and we could just keep playing like that. So really he trained me. kind of tell if he's done because if you try to just pet him, he'll be like, no, I want to keep playing. Unless he's done, in which case he'll just bring it back halfway and then sit on the ground satisfied. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm vegetarian. Not for like forever, but for a while. I think since like, I wanna say like 2012 or 20, no, 2011 or so, or so, somewhere around then. Hey, Tuco, are you done or 
we do not find it. <laughs> well, he seems like he's mostly done for now. So, I think I'm going to wrap up the stream. Thanks so much for joining, everyone. I really, uh, really enjoyed doing this, and uh, yeah, let me know. Let me know what you want to see next time.